Francis in Paris, and up with this terrible idea. I'd say, I'm going to build this building, and I'm ready to go. And the fellow would say, you're a bounder, and an absolute idiot. Leave this room. Be Stanford White, and the guy would go across the hall to Richard Morris Hunt, and he'd say, you're a cad, sir, and leave. And finally, the fellow had to come back around. Now, we get to the point, and this is an absolutely true story, up come, if you can believe it, Walter Gropius and Marcel Breuer are approached by this awful types that want to fill off the end of Park Avenue with the Pan Am building, which is a terrible idea, an awful idea to the city. And they both said, if we don't do it, they'll take it to Brand X. And of course, we can do it better than Brand X. We better do it. But it, where are we, group? You know, I mean, we ought to get back to that point. We know more about architecture than any client. I mean, we only have a right to lose an architectural argument to one of us. Certainly not to a lawyer, a dentist, a banker. What the hell does he know about scale, proportion, and so on? But we, we just back off. We listen to that stuff all the time. You guys can take me apart any minute. But certainly not a bloody dentist. All right. I do have notes. I wander and preach a lot. I must get back to where I was. Now, in this problem with client, we're all given the same client. We're all, you know, first the client is a son of a bitch. The site is absolutely impossible. And the budget is absurd. Now, by the time you get the building up, it doesn't do any good to say, as you stand back across the street and look at this thing with the colleague and say, did you ever meet her? You know, that building is either a good building or it's a bad building. And you know it when it's going up. And the rationale of which we are all trained in, boy, can we rationalize. It doesn't work. You know, it either does it or not. And I try to, and it's not such a hard thing to do. I wasn't born a rich kid. I had to do all this other stuff. I'm not rich now. I practice architecture. Nobody is rich that practices architecture. Any of you who are in this thing for money, go into dentistry right now. It's true. Anyway, in this process of getting a building up, there is this multi-delicious set of programs that we will all come to terms with, that is at once humane, beautiful, and we talk to every walk of life. And everybody that comes to see us, different than comes to see any of the other profession, is up. He wants to do something new, fresh, profitable, and he's really ready to go. And it's up to us to keep him up. Everybody that comes to see a doctor, a lawyer, he's either protecting himself from being screwed or he's being trying to screw someone else. But our guys are up, happy, and by God, so are we. Boy, what we can do. It's the idea that once we try this thing, is that you can step across the street and say, there, after 2,000 years of Western civilization, somebody had a go at it. Now, I'm going to show you stuff that I've been doing in the past five years or so. And three of the projects, uh, I regret to say, we just shot last week. Three and four projects, three in Greece and one in Cairo, that uh, have never been seen this side. And I'm extremely proud of them. And I'll talk about them as I go. But I just got the slides, put them together this afternoon, and they're blurred. <laughs> <laughs> so, on that note, if we could have the first slide, please. This is an 18th century Italian drawing of the Muse of Architecture. I've been waiting for that cat to come in my window for a very long time. <laughs> Is carrying the ideal scheme on a platter. But there's something that's very strange. I've never figured out that over his head, there's a figure that looks exactly like a bomb. <laughs> and maybe the building had very bad problems after all. I've got the wrong button. Now, here we are, trained 
nobly in the classics, history, sitting on our board, waiting for the muse to come to us. My God, they are steeped in the influence of Greek and Rome. A little more free spirit, that's what we need. My God, I'll really let it go this time. Now, here is a shot of perhaps the most important, most sophisticated, and I believe the most beautiful piece of urban design ever accomplished by man. It is Jacques-Ange Gabriel's Place de la Concorde in Paris, and we're just seeing a fragment of it, but you look at it and you say, what in this picture doesn't belong? And as you move about Paris, this is the view from the bedroom of our ambassador to Paris, and uh, there it is, right out the window. And over <laughs> Jacques-Ange Gabriel's École Militaire, and as you go about Paris, it stops. <laughs> and you can't get away from the bloody thing, and you approach it closer and closer, and finally you stand there, and you wonder, is this the best after 2,000 years of Western civilization that we can do? When you look at the humanity and the scale, and poor Mr. Eugene Boudrin and Anthony Sambadé, the dear little bird who doesn't even have a place to perch on that thing, it was, of course, designed by an American. The developer was an American. American money and built to the ego of Pompidou. I find it an obscenity. I do not want to identify my age, my civilization, or my philosophy, my children, anything with that. In perhaps one of the most beautiful cities in the world, there it sits. Now, is it any different than what we see in our own country, let alone Hong Kong, Cairo, Athens? No. What I am, and you will see, I hope, here in what I will be shouting at you tonight, is the responsibility that we must have when we approach a site. We must look next door, which this egomaniac obviously never did. I think if there's anything that has happened to architecture in the past seven years, that it is absolutely essential to look at your neighbor. Good architecture, like a well-mannered lady, never shouts at her neighbors. And this thing is not even shouting, it's screaming. Now, what should happen, of course, <laughs> this, you know, is Pruitt I go. It was in St. Louis. Many of you are too young to remember this. But it was originally designed by a highly honored and esteemed architect uh, still with us. <clears throat> and uh, it won, I think, several national awards as a contribution to public housing, not low cost, but low income. And within 15 years, it became a symbol of the ghetto, a symbol of entrapment, a symbol of isolation from our culture and society, a haven for crime, drugs, hatred, and abuse. And the only thing you could do was destroy it. <clears throat> Arthur Erickson one time spoke to the World Bank and suggested that each member and trustee of that august organization might someday, in future generations, if they carried on the way that they were as world criminals for what they are doing to the face of this earth with their resort <coughs> hotels, destroying beaches and valleys, and seashore that will never, ever come back again. And the sense of responsibility that we have, that we have for anything that we pour concrete, is, is absolutely profound. And very few people ever talk about it. No one ever talks about it. But, you know, James Renwick said way back in 1871 that the purpose of American architecture is to build a building that will last, give or take, 25 years. 
And if you look around, especially Manhattan, it's not a, you know, it's rather a long lifespan for most of the buildings until we started caring, protecting, and saving the ones that really should be saved. But I wish there were more angry students about buildings going up that should not go up, and more angry students about buildings being threatened to come down that are being torn down before we know it. We are losing our heritage and our culture lickety-split, and we're erasing it, as you know, with absolute faceless junk. I have great suspect for any members of our profession who hide, who don't put their name on the buildings they've designed. Any firm with the name of Falling Leaves, Friday afternoon and October 3rd, I hold in great suspect. All right, here we are. Isn't that marvelous? That sign says historic landmarks. Now, right in the middle of all of that stuff. And this is our city. It belongs to you, me, the French, and it, of course, is Washington, which is a Victorian city. Edward Durrell Stone, in one of his even more profound lax moments, said that it was a city of white buildings, monumental buildings, and park-like settings. It is not. It's a 19th century, red brick, Victorian, proud city. This is a finial on the Arts and Industry Building, which is imaging the Washington Monument behind on each of its finials. And it is truly a wonderful, wonderful thing. It has four absolutely identical facades with a small variation on the north facade. And it was built as the National Museum in 1881 for the Smithsonian. Prior to this time, before this building came along, the Smithsonian had no building at all and basically no collection. A few, you know, harpooning tools, stuffed birds, press butterflies, and things like that. And along came the world's greatest fair and exposition ever known in the history of man, which was the American Centennial in Philadelphia in 1876, where every country sent over their hardware. You know, World's Fairs are always great hardware stores. And at the end of the thing, and they built tremendous pavilions, even the Emperor of Brazil showed up. It was a grand thing. And so at the end of this thing, rather than ship the stuff home, they gave it all to the government in the United States in the name of the second secretary of the Smithsonian Institution by the name of James Beard. James Beard took all of this stuff and then took his entire budget and rented 400 railroad cars and loaded all this junk. It really was truly junk on board these 400 cars and shipped it to Washington, where it stayed in the marshalling yards of the Pennsylvania Railroad, which is right at the foot of Capitol Hill in the middle of what we now call the Mall. In other words, every congressman and senator would look out and see these things of which they were paying rent on every day. And he then had a gun to the head of the, Smithsonian, of the Congress, which he needed money, and he wanted a building, and he had a collection at last, besides his harpooning tools and butterfly nets. And so they said, oh, all right. So they held a competition. And the firm that had, had been doing schools in Washington of Kluth and Schultz, two very talented, really talented men, won this competition. And this indeed was the result. The building still holds the record of being the least expensive building ever built in the history of the United States by the federal government. It was something like $3.20 a square foot. Now, it was completed in 1781, where the inaugural ball of James Garfield and Chester Arthur was held. And during the first year it was open, when we went through this research, because we were given the commission to restore this thing, and we went through miles and miles, because the Smithsonian, after all, is a historical archive, and they keep very good archives of their own work. And this building was photographed like the Korean War. About every 10 minutes, somebody took a picture of it with this new thing called the camera. And so we had a very accurate record, as well as a written description of what in the world was going on. There were no drawings or specifications at the time. Well, out came a scandal around 1883, two years after the building opened. Three people died in there of exposure, you know, pressing butterfly wings. They just keeled over because there was no central heating. No, they had dirt floors inside. Only the director, who was in the far right-hand corner, had a pot-bellied stove. And after the scandal, it truly was, Congress said, oh, all right. And they put in a floor 
and some radiators. <laughs> Things never changed. Now, in the process of trying to put this thing together, this was when it opened for the centennial, bicentennial, and uh, we had, well, the Smithsonian took out of their tremendous collection uh, all of these objects which they had had since it opened. And the thing is truly a celebration. If you're in Washington, go in there, and it's the nicest celebration of Victorian taste going. If there's anything the Victorian truly believed was that nothing succeeds like excess. I mean, they really let it all hang out, I mean, in all sorts of color. The character is of the architecture is described in the exposition style. That is, there's a little bit of Germanic, a little Roman, a little Gothic, a little, you know, it's all there in glazed tile, and it truly is a marvelous building. Now, we, the building had such terrible inroads made on it by, of all people, the Smithsonian, they're the only people that lived in this thing, they attacked it like it was an object of hatred. Within the first week, they started painting over building partitions, filling it up, and blah, blah, blah. And finally, we didn't know what was going on. When we started over, this front entry was in tasteful aluminum, and the doors were long gone, and so we had to go through all of these photographs. Now, they had a stack of photographs, I'm not kidding, about four feet high, and there were no dates on them. So we went through, and we began to, here is one, that began to look at styles, fashions, automobiles, trolleys, anything that could tell us what date the picture was taken. This lady or young girl has, with you will notice, no mutton chop shoulder on her dress, which did not come in until 1890 and lasted really quite a while on up until about 1905, 1906, which means this is very close to when it opened, at least it's prior to 1890. The building opened in 1881, as it says, which means, therefore, if we blow that central entry up, we can see what the original door was, and which we did, and that's what we had replaced. But in this process, as we went through this thing, we found that the building had virtually been so destroyed, such inroads, the only thing that we could get back was the cruciform in the middle and this other white area, plus parts of the facade. Originally, I mean, it must have been really something to walk in that front door, because within the cruciform, at the center, there's this great high dome, which we'll see in a minute, and there is the Beaux-Arts, Le Marche, as you proceed to that, and the building open. But marching along on either side of this march were colonnades 40 feet tall, great arches, you see? And then you looked into these spaces where each one of those had a cupola, and you could look diagonally off into the other half of the cruciform, and it must have been one hell of an architectural experience to do that. Well, it's all filled in now with machinery and offices and blah, blah, and it was just too late, so we were given that. Now, going through this stack of photographs, we came across, you know, twiddly dumb, twiddly dee, standing here, and they're clearly standing at the north entry, and the false work of the arches are going in. There's a guy standing back there, and uh, I said, that's all right, you know, and we went on, and about a week later, I came across this. And I said, well, did Twiddly Dumb and Twiddly Dee hold their breath for these guys? <laughs> Nobody's moving, and you look under here, and this is Montgomery Miggs, who designed the pension building in Washington. That fellow with the pork pie hat who was a trustee of the Smithsonian, is William Tecumseh Sherman. I don't mention his name when I speak in the South. Anyway, this was another trustee, of course, as a banker. Every snowball has been aimed at that man's hat. The fellow in the bowler is James Beard, the second se Bard, Baird, second secretary of the Smithsonian. And who is that with the latest style, the jaunty Hamburg on his hat, a Chesterfield, his foot sportingly put on? That's the architect, and of course. <laughs> and who are these guys? <laughs> I read down here. They were the clerk of the works and the superintendent, right? And I looked at it and looked at it, and I went back to this. I went back, and Robert Lautman, who does most of my photography, gold medal of the AIA, he said they spliced it so that they could take part with the big boys. <laughs> Nothing changes. <laughs> Still the same. I love that story. Anyway. But the building, we had to replace all the encaustic tile which is a story good for a drink in any bar. It took forever and a day. And it was finally the original manufacturer who made it. 
The building had been painted something like 37 coats. We found the stencil patterns of black and white photographs in that stack that I saw you. Uh, because of the emulsion of the chemicals at the time, red turned out black, blue turned out gray, and so we got up in the cherry picker, and as you pick away, because we knew the pattern, because the black and white told us that, it then told us that this was pale pink and this was pale green, and you knew after reading anything besides Wyatt Earp that those colors that they never worked in pastels. So I, as the historian said, arbitrarily, capriciously, willfully, arrogantly selected the palette of colors, and I think they're beautiful in the hell of them. <laughs> Here is uh, the way it looks now with this incredible exposition that's in there. As I said before, about 90% of it was in the original show, and it really is an event. Uh, the encaustic tile, we couldn't draw that pattern. Can you focus that? I, I, is it sharp? I can't tell. Anyway, the encaustic tile is an incredible process where it was made by uh, the same people that make uh, Minton, China, in Stoke-on-Trent. And they can take one tile and have intricate patterns of two and three colors in it. And it's all baked at one time. And the, the uh, pigment is in there about an eighth of an inch, so it lasts forever. And practically every church, every public building in America had this stuff. And the Smithsonian, I think, was the first to say it was very outre, and they threw it all out. And we put it back together from photographs. And we couldn't draw the pattern, because their pencil lead couldn't get the damn geometry to close. But the nifty men that were on their you know, knees for about three months did it. And it really is, it was something to watch them lay it, let alone watch it come back because we found some of the actual tiles underneath that stairwell that they hadn't ripped out, and we could figure out the palette and the color and so on. Now, the average American house is 1,890 square feet. This house is 1,890 square feet. Uh, I didn't work in that direction. It just came out that way. But as you see, what I'm trying to do is talk tonight about being a generalist, of doing little things and big things. And it, when you are needed as an architect, you can sense it. And when you can make a contribution, you know it. And in this case, it sat on the last site in an established neighborhood, which meant that it had been used as a dump for 50 years, as everybody built their other houses and threw the trash on this thing. So it was made up of weed trees and about 40 feet of fill. It was a triangle. It falls 20 feet from left to right. I'm standing on the road. And the road looks like an outdoor museum of every, every architectural cliche. There's chicken shed modern. There's the butterfly roof of the 50s. There's the paneled section of the 60s. And, pretty, and there's a lot of nice eclectic stuff. But it's every young architect, uh, hence some home, <laughs> had a chance to do things on this street. My client, in this case, were in their late 60s, uh, retired. She was a painter. And that's when you see the bubbles for her studio. And but the building, it's an absolute triangle, isosceles triangle. And it falls, as I said, 20 feet from left to right. But from the front of that building face, it falls 40 feet to the rear. So we took this basic house house form. You know, it's the house that we drew when we were in school. If we put a chimney on the side and some steel wool coming out, it would be that house that children always do. If it was painted green, it came off the Monopoly game. And so we lined three of these little Monopoly four up. And so it's, the idea is to get you to come in. You know, if a house or any building doesn't say it's better on the inside than it is on the outside, you're an idiot to go inside. And so it should sort of say, we've got something in here really kind of fun. And it wants to get you in. As you come up, the front door begins to expose itself. And if you go in there, you get what you see. I think that any building should promise, should deliver the promise that it extends to you. And it's always very disturbing to me when I'm going to a house, especially in pompous houses that we all know, and you drive up the long circular driveway. And there sits this house with a split pediment and four columns out in front. 
and green shutters and brass door knocker and the neighbor was 16 feet away to the right and 16 feet away to the left. Anyway, you open up the front door, the ceiling is eight feet high, you wander around this Williamsburg green rabbit warren and end up in the garden wondering why you'd ever come in the front door after this fanfare that they gave you coming up the drive. So when I see a house with a roof that goes up, I want to ask why, this is the back of my head. And now we get in here and we see why and why the triangular window works. There are tricks that you will see in here that I've or I found that I didn't invent them, but there are illusions of spaces. I have never had a client yet who's had enough money to build the size building that he wants to build. And by taking tricks that we've all been taught and you are being taught, they're older than the hills. I have made a practice of building the illusion of spaces. If you'll notice anything in my work, there is an absolute absence of scale within the architecture. What tells you the size of this room is the size of the furniture, and better yet, you and me when we're in it. We, after all, are the most important thing in a building. The art is a second. The furniture is a long, slow third. Nobody marries the sofa. Anyway, so what we have here is like, as you'll see in the rest of my buildings, like being in a piece of origami that all architects really do is make space. And it's that quality of space, the scale of it, and the quality of light within that gives the building meaning. I like to think that, an art, that a house or a large building is memorable if it is irrational and therefore expresses the human condition. There's something nutty about beauty as well. There's something nutty about no baseboard. It always drives people nuts. Finger, you know, white walls. What do you do about children? What have you always done about children? Anyway, I have three kids. Everybody has children. We can either paint the wall peanut butter, or we can, or we can paint it fingerprint, you know? Now, if the wall was green, which most of us grew up in, yuck, that if you touch that wall with peanut butter, mama has to come along with babo and wash it off, right? Pretty soon the green's gone, and what do you get? White, all right? So we're down to white to start with, and that's the rationale that I've tried. Anyway, as you go through this thing and you watch as these pavilions fold and you're looking out to the deck because just eight feet, no, 16 feet, there's an eight foot side yard and eight feet away is the neighbor's house. And he's right there. So I took every window going that way so that you don't see the guy next door. And it's a 40 foot drop. You see a treetop edge and it's really kind of neat in this surprising little lot. Of course, you step out on that deck it's a different story. The guy's right on your lap. And we've planted him out since then. But notice how clever Robert Lautman is. He's right there at the left. And you think you're all alone. But he's just beyond that tree. But this is looking back at the pavilion of where we go from the studio to the far left, dining, kitchen, living room, library, and bedroom here on the side. And as the sun slowly sets with pink clouds, which every architect needs. Wait a minute. Something's going wrong. Now, see that? That is the owner's furniture that they moved in after I moved out what was there before. Now, Bob Lautman, photographer, always says, why do you get so upset? He said, your architecture is strong enough to carry the day? I don't think it is. You know? That sofa you could buy at Goodwill, 40 bucks, I guess. Uh, you know, I mean, I wonder, you know, after going through this entire process with these really dear people, and we talked about scale and light and all of these things that are important to us, and at the last moment, they did that. And it wasn't a matter of money. They just felt sort of comfortable in this old stuff. Well, it's, to me, it's a piece of architectural error. Another family will live in there, and I guess they will understand what we were trying to do. However, I didn't, I didn't really read my client, you know? And it's a thing, and something I think we should all understand. All of us have just so many buildings in us. And there's nothing worse than to go through an entire process of this thing of making something out of nothing, working drawings, specifications, read the bloody thing, negotiate it, and then they get a divorce. You know, that's a terrible thing. I mean, those drawings, they don't even make good wallpaper. 
is supposed to be a building. And if they do something like that, that's a breach of faith. I tried to write in my contract, as it happened twice, you know, better living through architecture. Anyway, I lost two projects through a divorce. And I wrote this phrase in there. I said, should the partnership called the owners divide prior to the completion of the project herein described, that they shall pay the architect twice the fee herein described. <laughs> My lawyer took a very dim view of that. <laughs> but it really should be something, you know. You see, that's the way we furnish it. Half of that stuff is out of my house and other clients' houses. And, you know, think about it. You know, it really is, they do irreparable damage. I think, I consider that an absolute breach of faith. That's why I call them a rum lot. They can do that just like that and say, too bad. We changed the new rules. And it's only your life that they're trotting by out there. Uh, who to serve, who worked in the great house of the same period. Now, when they came along to make this thing a subdivision, they laid magically and imaginatively and innovatively a grid plan on it. This building ended up on the corner of two streets. And of course, the main house had to go. And they tore it down. They then subdivided it and sold lots. And this thing, well, in the late 19th century and early 19th century, they built, filled the neighborhood with really grand houses of the romantic styles, the neoclassic styles, that are really very beautiful and responsible to the trees. And this house, trying to catch up, when my client bought it, it was painted turquoise. This aluminum wrought iron was held up over a porch. It was never there originally. And it looked a little like naming Dodd Eisenhower in a ball gown. And it was rather embarrassing. And I looked up on top, and you can see in the gable end just the slight strap work of the Queen Anne detailing. And after chipping away, we found some color schemes. And my client needed a bigger house, and so we hit it. And this is what she looks like now. It has, I think, one of the best named addresses in Chevy Chase. It's on the current corner of Oiving and Magnolia. Isn't that nice? Anyway. Uh, we, the house where the lady is playing the piano was the front door. And we took off the porch and put in a bay window from floor to ceiling and painted the house. And then we put in a link and we just duplicated that gable end. Now those bay windows are just about as Victorian as my Chevrolet. But at least they are polite to its neighbor. And when I was given the commission, my client was ready to tear it down. They liked the neighborhood. Their friends lived there, near the schools where the kids wanted to go. And it really, I could have, because there's no architectural review board, no control in that neighborhood, and I could have done one of my white houses and or black fixed glass and flexed all of the current muscles. And this was in 75, the beginning of postmodernism. And it seemed very wrong to me. It seemed much better just to shut up and turn the corner with some respect towards what we are and who my clients were. Inside, of course, it's a modern house. My clients are still in their 30s, and the windows go to floor to ceiling and glass. It houses their collection of modern furniture and modern paintings. That living room is 65% glass, which very few modern houses can claim. And it is at once comfortable and polite, and it has a certain snap to it. But on the outside, when you look at it, it seems to be reasonably quiet and shuts up with the neighborhood. But as the sun goes down, you begin to recognize that indeed it is a house that only could have been built in 1975. And it is, as I said, like a well-mannered lady. I'm very proud of this thing. This is Gettysburg College, which is a small liberal arts college north of Washington, just over the Pennsylvania line. And it is a polite gathering of 19th century buildings, this being a marvelous thing called Gladfelter Hall. It, of course, is of Richardsonian Romanesque heritage, uh, bending into all sorts of other styles as it turned its corner. This photograph doesn't show this great epsidal end here with the curving bay. But for me, I was given a commission, which was my first large building. As you know, you get typecast like Lassie in this profession of ours, and it's very hard to change what people think you do. 
people still think all I do is houses. And I said, that's why we've got this loose leaf notebook. And to win this project away from the architects that they were interviewing, it was a little like winning the Grand Prix. And because all I had done is houses that they would know, and it was very difficult. Anyway, in trying of looking at that campus and trying to build what would be the largest building on the entire campus, even larger than this, in square foot and massing, it seemed the only right thing to do would be to try and abstract this sort of style and try to make the building lower if possible and to shut up if I could. Although my building is 90,000 square feet, this one is around 40. And uh, I had a very tough problem. So I took, as you will see, the same palette, same roof, brick, brownstone, massing. And we started off there. You can see Gladfelder. And here's this absidal end uh, with brownstone and brick. And we sunk the building four feet lower than the rest of the campus to get it down because it is so damn massive. And we abstracted the tower on the way in and built this great pivoting plaza of which the entire campus, my god, that's me. I mean, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I've never been that close. Anyway, uh, but there she is. And it's hidden behind trees that we were lucky enough to save. And when you come up to it on the backside, there is this, all the technical services are in one wing. My librarian was an empire builder, and he demanded to have his own can. And there it is. When it, you know, that all the laws of modern architecture is to express the function. <laughs> anyway. OK, as you come in the front door, those, the Muslim people uh, make jam and jelly. And uh, they gave a big grant, so they got the name on it. I think the building has a bit of muscle. This is in the stair tower, as you look up. It's a triangle that goes, it stands free, as you can see, uh, from the round brick cylinder with the skylight above. And uh, inside each one of those bays uh, are carols and for students to abuse the furniture that we also design. My office does, we never work with an interior decorator. We do all of our own interiors, as much landscaping as client will let us get away with. We do all of our own graphics. It has been said I would dress my clients if they'd give me an opportunity. There's some, never mind. Uh, this is the end elevation of this great big thing. <laughs> I mean, I used to think that if, when I was starting out in this frozen music trade, if you didn't get an elevator under your belt at the time you were 40, you reasonably had blown it. Well, this is when I was 52. And, uh, it was my first elevator. I ride up and down it all the time like that thing. Uh, this is the only shot I have of this truly funny little building. But any of you who know uh, the Long Island shore going out of New York that every Saturday and Sunday and nearly every day during the summer, the sound is just filled with sailboats. And those of you who sail or are boating, if you go through the same problem I do, but if I'm out there and I see, oh, shapes on land, I will say, my god, it's Camelot, and I'll come about and sail to see what that building looks like. And it always turns out to be a crackling plant or a refinery or a dump. And, uh, but these forms are always fooling to see. And I had this rather incredible sight. It's a very dark green hill going up right behind you. And I'm sitting right on, this picture was taken really from the water's edge. And so I went back and I did some research and I found the Temple of Hephaestus, which is actually six columns and not four. But it was one of the few Greek temples that where the void was smaller than the column. And I could then get a 10-foot high sliding glass door that would go back in. And I took the proportions of the Temple of Hephaestus and repeated it in a Palladian plan, a perfectly symmetrical front and back. And you get in a sailboat, and because we've always been told that columns are round, that bloody thing looks absolutely round. And every Sunday, there are wrecks coming ashore, and everybody trying to get closer. <laughs> well, that's, it's a summer house. It's great fun. Uh, this is, as I told you, after all of the effort of being in Greece 10 days ago and in Egypt, the slides, as I loaded them tonight, last night, or this morning, turned out to be blurred. So this is the way I see all the time. So 
So those of you with glasses, if you'll take them off and hand them to the person next to you who doesn't wear glasses, we'll see them all exactly the same way. This is a library uh, for Dere Pierce College outside of Athens, Greece. It is an American school with a, uh, as all of these projects are that I've done abroad, uh, that were basically started as missionary schools in the early part of the century. This particular school started out as Pierce College in Turkey. And as you know, the great uh, massacre in that area by the Turks of the Greeks in around 1905, uh, the school moved to outside of Athens and built this, uh, a series of buildings. And then in 1966, they hired the great, you know, the reasonable architect of Greek, Doxiadis, Constantine Doxiadis, to do the campus. And I was given this commission in 74 to build a library in the middle of Doxiadis' buildings. And as you'll see in the later slides, I basically took his party, a structural form, and abstracted that so that I didn't want to shout too much, but could sort of, I thought, uh, bring more light and scale. Greek light is like nothing else. It is incredibly bright. And so we use dark glass here, and these sunscreens go all the way around, and the skylight in the middle. And if you can see the double row of structure there, it's because the building is totally freestanding, and there's this moat that goes all the way around it, so we can get light into the lower level. There are three buildings, this building being the library, that little narrow one, which is connected by two bridges that are enclosed, houses technical services on two levels, and behind that is a bunker that carries all of the heating and mechanical. And as there you can see the Doxiadis buildings, which the view is right over the plains of Attica. And you can see the ocean from there and the mountains beyond. And it truly is terrific. Doxiadis, for some arrogant thought, that if you put glass in classroom windows, the students will never study. They'll look out of the windows. And so he put those high windows in all of the classrooms. And it gave me the opportunity to give him floored ceiling glass uh, in mine. It's, you know, the dead grass, the stones, cypress trees, pine. I guess it was about 104 when we shot this, which is typical early September weather. It can rain there as it does in the winter. Uh, I have seen it with four inches of snow, of which the Greeks don't know how to come to terms with. But this building, as I touched on earlier, is funded all by your tax money and mine through the Agency for International Development. It's a marvelous program because it says the money that they give to American schools and hospitals abroad, they must use American architects. <laughs> all right? And uh, this, uh, my four buildings, I'm going to show you three tonight because the fourth one, the interior, wasn't finished. Yeah. Uh, the architectural record is going to publish all of them, which makes me very pleased, because they paid for Lautman to go over there and back, which is better than me paying. But it's all based on the principle of American schools and hospitals abroad. And I can't think of a better way. That library carries every piece of anti-American literature and book. Nothing is censored. Nothing is edited. You can go in there. The flag flies, and it's wide open. And it's not censored. It's not a propaganda machine. This school is fully accredited in the United States and Britain. You can transfer from here to graduate school. They don't beat you to death with the glories of our culture. They give you our education and let you make your choice. Down here, as the school in Cairo that I will show you, as with this school, practically every leader of Greece has gone to the school since it started, because it's not all that old. Uh, and in Cairo, most certainly, practically everyone has. But this is inside the library with the double rows of sunscreens that you can see. And the building beyond is the new gymnasium, which we also just finished. Oddly enough, the young lady on the right comes from Nashville. Isn't that strange? <laughs> now, we're looking across this. See, there's a central stair underneath the skylight where it goes down. There's a landing and it goes back down. We'll see another site later. But this bridge is what ties the thing together in this level. And straight ahead are these sort of stained three pipes in that courtyard between technical services, which in this case is on the right. The air conditioning 
from the bunker beyond, goes underground and comes up and blows in here and goes under the two floors to cover the floor below. Everything blows down the same as the heat. But those things as you go down the stair, and there you can see the bridge up to the left that we just saw, and the sculpture court that goes all the way around, giving that incredible quality of light to the reading stations around it with the stacks in the center, that you can see how the light still comes through these light wells, and there come those three strange stacks, like very, <laughs> very silly sculpture, beautifully enclosed in glass. They have, uh, like most libraries, uh, the problem of losing their collection. You know, I mean, books grow feet you know, very easily. And uh, you can't have windows that open not only for climate control, but also of books being tossed out of windows. And uh, so it's all hermetically sealed. Just if that last picture, if we turned around, you'd see this happy throng all going off to the gymnasium. Now, as you know, the most important building on any campus is the library. It carries the most important documents and the reason for a university or college. And really the least important, unfortunately and usually the biggest, is the gymnasium. And how do you come to terms with those two symbols? Here you've got this great big thing because of the function and use of games being played inside and the library, which it's hard to do. So my library roof is actually about 10 feet higher than this. And the gymnasium goes down the hill to the left. And this is looking down these precipitous steps, which are 60 feet wide. And that's the large drain that goes down. And that's the canopy to the entry as you go in. And this is down the other way. Looking up, we get a sense of the scale with the sunscreens and the structure outriding, as I did at the library, giving a nod to the rest of the campus by Constantine Doxiotis. And the size of these columns are, and height of them are at once absolutely silly just to hold up that structure that is only doing anything else but saying, Doxiatis, I'm with you and we're part of the team and I'm articulating basically a box. The concept that we tried to play here, these are the fire exits on the far side as you come off the main playing floor. Notice the absence of panic hardware. <laughs> the doors will open just as easily. Anyway, they don't have to lock them there. But it's uh, a gymnasium auditorium and here it's serving as an auditorium. It has three cross courts and one full length court. And all of the uh, dressing rooms and everything are underneath that section over there. That's on grade level. And if you're standing up there, you can write on the opposite side. It's the same way. And there you can see the ocean and the mountains beyond. I wanted to design a very beautiful room that you could play basketball in. I don't know why gymnasiums have to be a clear, honest expression of heating pipes. I've never figured that out. This is down below the rake of the seating, and again on ground level, where there's dance and ping pong and wrestling. It was initially designed to take a swimming pool until someone wisely calculated that there isn't enough water to fill it up, partly, in Greece. Water is very rare and very expensive. This is the uh, uh, power plant. Again, there's a square bunker that's 30 meters away from the main gymnasium itself, as you can see the whole width of it here. And the chimney stands free of it, and of course is painted blue. Everything in Greece is either blue and white. And it's, the colors really work there very much. The quality of concrete in Greece is just extraordinary. You know, they had an incredible uh, earthquake in Athens a year ago, last January, of 6.5. To obtain a building per permit in Athens, the architect signs for it, and there's no inspection, and the architect is totally responsible. Well, being a gringo, I have to have a Greek do that. And the way the law is written in Greece, which on one hand, it makes very good sense, that when the building permit is issued, the architect must show a check that he has been paid in full the maximum fee allowed, which is really neat. It means you get paid at the right time, except the law says the maximum fee is 2%, which means that every architect is arms under the table taking bakshish. He usually owns a piece of the building or he gets something else because he can't live on 2% of the work that he does. 
in this regard, because there's no inspection and that the architect does it, that you would think that they would cheat like mad on the concrete and steel and that you get a good shake that all fall down. In that Richter shake of 6.5, which is a real honey if you've ever been in one, the only thing that cracked fell down, nothing fell down in Athens, and the only thing that cracked was the 10-year-old Athens Hilton designed by us. Think about that. So it speaks an awful lot for the integrity of that little man placing his rods with the concrete. And it's the best concrete I've ever, I've ever gotten. It's really terrific. Unpainted and very clean. I now switch a little button. Hello. Are they there? Should I switch boxes or no? No. Uh, do I use another box? Yes. No. All right, we'll go back. All right. This is on uh, the eastern shore of Maryland, and where the predominant style, if you will, is a white frame, clabbered, Gothic revival house in that there's a long slope that goes up to a peak and it comes back down again. This house, if you will keep in mind, both the library, the gymnasium, and the little white house that we saw before, it has an absolute ambiguity of scale. You don't know how big the bloody thing is. And when we got into doing this, it was for a very specific reason. I had a very large house to build and to sit out there on that absolutely flat land, you looked rather vulgar if you were really as big as I had to build. So there are certain devices that tell us how, what size things are, the height of doorknobs, stairways, window mullions, chair rails, all of these things that is in the vocabulary of architecture. And I have tried to always leave off as many horizontals as I possibly can. In this building, we changed the normal clabbered of a six inch weather to three and two and a half inches, narrowing the size of that horizontal line. We raised the doorknob up six inches just to throw it off the other way. And we put this thing out there. When we started to build it, went out there in the truck. And we standing on the truck, we realized that if we were up just five feet, we could see this little creek go down until it met the Tredevon River and the Chesapeake Bay beyond. And, but if we sat dead level, you'd lose it. So we went over on the other side of this peninsula that we were on, where the creek bit in, and we carved an alley 80 feet wide, dug down six feet, and it's 600 yards long, and it tapers to 20 feet. We took all of that dirt, brought it over here, and made this hill five feet high so that we could get up there and then get that force trompe perspective, which I must say works very well. There you can see the bite that we carved in, and the house from the river view. Is that sharp? I can't tell. When we were <laughs> laying this thing out, I was sitting on a ladder just about where the living room is, a 20-foot high ladder with a walkie-talkie talking to some men 600 yards away, about in scale to where that thing is, back to the, about the back of the room. And the temperature is around oh, 98 degrees, humidity 98, in the middle of August. And a boat went down this little creek, a couple of watermen going out for, you know, for clams. And you know, over the water, voices here. And they look up this hot morning, and here's some nut sitting in the middle of this field on a 20-foot ladder. <laughs> I don't have to tell you what they said. It was just marvelous. <laughs> But as you approach, again, you begin to get an idea somewhat when you start seeing how big it is. Actually, that's 10 feet to the first level. And the, all of the windows on the second floor are four feet high. And they're what we call sit-down windows. That is, that when you are in a bedroom, there's no place to stand up. And when you're standing up in those rooms, you can't see anything. And when you get in bed, the view is marvelous. When you sit down, the view is marvelous. But nobody, unless you're to lose little trek, can look out of a four-foot window. And it has a nice sense of scale uh, to do that. Well, that way, I could reduce and produce this sort of, sort of question of what in the world is going on. But the room inside is two stories high. And it basically is a cruciform plan. And this folded origami, if you will, 
goes right on to the bridges crossing in between. I am not responsible for that brass covered fireplace. Uh, that's packaged fire, and I hate those things. Before we took this picture, I spent one day trying to tape it out in black tape, and it didn't work. Anyway, I just disclaim that. This is, you get an idea of how this origami is going on, and these bridges go across as, as you cross over, and the house at once opens itself up to each other and explains that promise of what are those screwy round holes doing up there anyway and what's going on. In Minnesota, where it gets very, very cold, uh, and I was given a commission to do a house on a 20-acre meadow of a, on a hill that fell from about 200 feet high down a very gentle slope that it reached one of the lakes, being the Land O-1000 Lake. And it seemed, as Mr. Wright said, never build on the hill, but be of the hill. So we built six barns and linked them together. The one on the right is the garage. The on the far side is a separate guest house. And then there are four of these things that link back and forth. Barns, as you know, are either red, white, or black. And I painted this thing black with an idea of what it would do in that incredible winter. It was 20 below zero, and we shot this, four feet of snow. And if there's anything yeah. I discovered is that with the quality of light with black, it is with white. You and I all know there's no such color as white. Look at how many whites there are here. Look how many whites there are in this room. There's no such color as pure black. We go from deep purple to brown to gray, and it's just an incredible symphony of light. There's the lake down below and this gathering of buildings. We built a six-foot-high retaining wall here so we could level it out, put an orchard of green linden trees in the middle, and we sowed all 22 acres with daisies, no Queen Anne's lace, I might add, and bachelor buttons throughout the entire hill. And daisy, you know, is a weed and a field flower, and it has taken over the entire thing, and it really is neat. There are 22,000 variety of daisies. We have daisies blooming there in early March, right through November, from Black Eyed Susan Marietta's, and it really is a celebration. And you get into this thing, and there's that green orchard in the middle. But as you walk around, and watch that black change to just a delicious gray. And there's the front, we're now, this is taken from the front door, and that's very accurate. That wall, this house is brand new, but the wall is now black, that retaining wall. And inside, it's trying, you see, what we were trying to do here very desperately was have an express a very taut skin. You can't have a gutter, a downspout, because the snow slides will tear the stuff all off. And it's to express that taut skin as we went from black to white, how thin the wall was as we changed those temperatures. And if you look, where we go from white, where the glass hits it, and you change in this place about 70 degrees of temperature, there, that's black right outside there, and that's still black, and it's still black, and you don't ever get black. I had, for a brief time, I might add, a Cockney secretary, and I was showing her my work so she would get familiar, and we had just finished this house, and she said, yeah, you painted the house black. I don't like black, do you? What you painted black for? Didn't you like them? <laughs> when you think of how many ways we could get back at clients rather than color, Anyway, but again, in reaching for the light to explain why the roof goes up, always reaching so you can get those funny slit that give you this pattern and shift of time as the light that comes through that slit follows the sun and sparkles the room. If you don't get light, I have found, in high volumes of spaces, it has a weight and a presence that's absolutely oppressive, and you've got to get that thing to sparkle, otherwise it gets very silly. I never predicted that they would get rank. We've got a corporal on the right and private on the left, which is difficult. And as the sun slowly sets, now here's a bit of real cornball, which I did this morning. Ha ha ha. Guess where we are. Uh, this is about 6 o'clock in the morning, about 10 days ago. And uh, that's Cheops, of course. That is. 685 feet tall. The Washington Monument is 555 feet. 
She at one time, as you know, was all smooth white marble. You could read her for miles and miles away. That's the head of the Sphinx. She was falling apart badly. But anyway, I'm now going to talk about my library for the American University in Cairo. I was given this commission when I was a boy, 12 years ago. It, uh, we were Oak Ground in 1972. I started designing in 70. In 76, it was firebombed and blew up higher than Gilroy's kite. And we started right back. Didn't change a line, stubborn bull. And we started off all over again. We saved only two columns after the fire. I never thought concrete could burn. It turns, as you will see in the building, my spans are 88 feet. Each beam is six foot six in depth to cover the 88 feet for a library loading. And the columns are triangular, six feet by six feet by six feet, solid concrete. The heat for the formwork was in there. And all of those sticks that were holding the second floor up were firebombed in three separate locations. And it got so hot that by the time the fire brigade got there and they turned the hose on it, it exploded. The concrete was a color of salmon, bright pink. And the aggregate in there, you know, with that size, exploded in, in ways that you just couldn't believe what could happen. To a building, and you think of concrete, who can knock it down? You know? But it's, it was an event. Anyway, isn't that marvelous? It is, it is Cairo. It is every bit a mixture of culture and ridiculousness and sorrow. When I started work in Cairo in 1974, from being overloaded, in our building we put in a holding tank to hold it and thought we'd be clever and sneak it into this crack thing during the middle of the night. They built so many new hotels and office buildings for all of the money in the banking since the trouble in Lebanon that there's no housing and they haven't had time to put in the sewer. The alarming thing is that the water line is in the same trench with the sewer. The telephone system is practically non-extent. The traffic you run from building to building with a runner carrying your message. A long distance telephone call takes three days to place. The Egyptian is at once proud, beautiful, honest. I've never once heard of a crime of violence, a mugging, a rape, or even a robbery or petty theft. It's, 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 it's an event, a human event, to go there and to work and someday I'd like to meet Madame Lola. This was groundbreaking, auspicious. Uh, it's true. This is the day we did it. It's right out of a pharaonic freeze. Incidentally, everything is done with that ads. There was no bulldozer, no trucks. The entire dirt was taken away like that. God only knows where it went, in the Nile, in someone's trash can. <laughs> but there was an army of these guys, bare feet, walking through the city with these oil cans or a basket on their head carrying the stuff. Came on, when they finished the excavation, out comes a, a water buffalo called a bamuth. AUC, like in a football game written on the side, this green-faced fellow in the green pajamas slit his throat right after that as a sacrifice. They butchered it and passed it out to all the workmen, and they danced. They did this on every floor, and they killed two on the roof when we finished. <laughs> I was heard that by the time they got to the roof, it would have been me instead of a gamut. But anyway, there it is, you know. There comes the formwork. Notice the footings are filled with pure caca. <laughs> and this dear man, the ramps, they have no lifts and elevators and cranes. So they build ramps up out of bamboo tied with bamboo thongs, you know, fa uh, 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 palm thongs that tie this thing together. And the ramp goes up. And if they're taking the cooling tower up on the roof, they've got a nifty man like that and a galabea. And this is all he does. He's a cheerleader. He says, come on, Ahmed. You can do it, Ahmed. And he gets these guys carrying this stuff up the wall. It is 
it's entirely different. Well, after 12 years, this is what we finally did. And I'm incredibly proud of the thing. This was the model that we built way back in 70 uh, to explain to the trustees of what we were about. This is an existing theater on the campus to the left, uh, Department of uh, Humanities on the right, and there was a tennis court where my building sits on a very busy street corner right in the center of downtown Cairo. The Athens Hilton and the Nile is just a block away across two blocks away. The Cairo Museum is just around the corner, and it's, you really are in the center of this incredible city. Now, what do you do as an American spending American money abroad? It's always the temptation to walk in and say, look at us, this giant, this industrial giant, this rich giant, this powerful giant, look at our building and what we can do, what we are doing for you. And it really is vulgar and obscene. We did this for the AUB, in the American University in Beirut, expensive hardware, expensive building, a technology that they would never understand. So what we tried to do here was to build a building using materials that I could buy off the shelf, a technology that they teach at the American University in Cairo as well as at the huge Cairo University of 35,000 students, that, to, that the glass is no different the hardware, the knob, and so forth, the lighting fixture, is something they can do. It's just changing the approach and the thinking around. It's the first open stack library, which nobody has ever seen. We put it right in the middle of town, and I tried to take advantage of this oasis. There are two campuses of the American University. This is the second one, and there's one a block up off of this diagonal. So we built buildings sitting on the corner, and we put a tunnel in. See where the two triangles are? That's right on the corner. And you go into a tunnel, and when you come out, you're right underneath this bridge. You can see where the other two huge columns are. If you walk straight there, if you come up those steps, as you'll see later, they have 15-inch risers. You can tell when we designed this. They were called miniskirt steps at the time. Anyway, if you walk around, then you get a ramp, you see, a very steep slope, and you step up normal steps onto an existing plaza that was there, and then up another step onto my new plaza, come around the screen that I covered the Department of Humanities, which had been torn down one wing and it looked very bad, so I just put a screen around it. And then comes my building with the link of fire stairs and the open span. Now, as you know, librarians like museum directors. They lose people in their buildings, you know? And so you've got to make them, and they hate columns, floors, walls, ceilings. You know, and but still you've got to get the stuff away, and so you work hard on them. And so we came up. This was the first library we did, and there are certain things that come out. It's really bizarre. But if you see the distance between stacks, well, there are distances that you know that are very humane and measurable that you can get through, squat down, and read a title. And the narrowest is that is three foot two to give room for your butt to get down. So it says that that determines a definite module. Therefore, it sets a definite module for the lighting system overhead, because that means the light has got to go right on that three foot two all the way. And that, therefore, sets where the column goes in the structure. And pretty soon, your librarian is absolutely trapped. He can't get out of there. He's got to build the thing. So I said, well, we'll get all of that stuff out. We'll give him absolutely open law. And we'll give a non-module to this lighting system. So as you'll see later, we have a black egg crate ceiling with fluorescent lights up above. So you, he can put his stack, rearrange his stack, his tables, his reading stations, any way he wants. And you can still read it. And he's not dictated by what the form may be. And consequently, the library may go, may grow in its own way. There we are from the street. I was, built the building, as I said, out of concrete. It is now the color of the Western Desert, which blows a quarter of an inch of dust on everything every day in Cairo. There is the building right next door to it. I'm exactly the same height. It has been said that two fellaheen, which they call this marvelous man, the Galabea, had a violent discussion right in front of my building that it was an outrage that they're building a prison right in the middle of downtown Cairo. And I think that's all right, too. But if you go in, you can just see the light of the oasis and the greenery through the tunnel on the diagonal. It's very, very bright when you're in this area. And if you walk through there, 
you then, now we're right at the other end. There's the street down below. And this tool entrance is really an entrance to some classrooms under the plaza. And you can't really tell the scale very well because those steps are really so large that they don't read. But there's the tunnel again. And those are 15 inch rises. You'll get an idea of scale this later on. But in, in this twilight shot, where you're standing looking at the front door, going across the bridge, there's technical services. The mini skirt steps are going right to the left, going down. The tunnel alley is going underneath this bridge. You have the depth of span of six foot six and 11 foot clear height. And so as you see the desk and the collection open up, it's, I believe, that when you enter in a library, you should, really shouldn't ask where things are. But here you can see the circulation desk, the card catalog, the reserve section, the readers, and you can get to the stuff. The color, as you know, which is very difficult in color photography, to balance off between the cold light of fluorescence and the orange light of incandescence. But this is what gives the color. The actual real color is that that black ceiling is actually a powder blue with the other light. And it's, it's, it's really quite pretty. The floor, Cairo, is dirty, uh, extremely dirty. And you have to have carpet for acoustics and things like that. And if there's anything they have a lot of in Egypt, it's old tires. And this is, the, this is made out of those tiles, which you see a lot of in railroad stations and air, airplane stations, uh, airports, uh, of this, the fiber of the tire. And they're made in tiles. And there they are. And they're totally indestructible. You can grind a cigarette out and spill coffee on it. It won't burn. Wheel carts on it. And it's something that is absolutely essential. Frank Mankiewicz, who's an old friend of mine, said, paraphrasing, after his first trip to Cairo, he's <laughs> paraphrasing Winston Churchill. He said, give us the job, and we will finish the tools. Well, that's what happens. My elevator, this building took 12 years to build. My elevator, I mean, you can't believe what went on with stories that are real horror stories. But my god, here it is. And I'm so bloody proud of it with all of its rough concrete that it came out as well as it did. A friend of mine, when I started, said that whatever you build in Egypt never turns out the way you know. Whatever you plan in Egypt never turns out the way you planned it, but it turns out magnificently well. And it really is quite true. This picture, again, with butt glazing, but it was to express, I did that purposely so you could really feel that we're reaching for the light. You can just see the sunscreens up above there. But so we're reaching for the light that bounces off of that terrace. And we light the entire gallery and the entire reading spaces by reflected light. There you can have an idea of the scale of this crazy thing. And the quality of concrete, it is so awful, it's marvelous. Yeah. It's, uh, when you go to the east wing of the National Gallery and you watch that knife edge of I am go up the 90 feet just straight as a string. Mine varies from three quarters of an inch to an inch and a half, and it goes up this <laughs> Now, you, you can hardly see her, but again, it's going back towards this oasis of the central campus. And at twilight, with that incredible, lingering, lingering twilight that the Egyptian and the desert light gives you, uh, I feel that I have something that is at once Egyptian and is at once American. Mm -hmm. My colleague who was president of that college, when I started out on this thing, that he died, the rat. And I asked a poet to give me a line which we could put on that building, which would best symbolize all of these efforts that we went through. And only a poet could come up with it. But it says, to live full lives, leave some record. And that really is what we're all about. This is a house in Lexington, Kentucky, that every now and then, uh, you know, none of us, none of us have ever given a carte blanche. You know, that's always the great myth. The client that comes along and says, oh, do, do it the way you'd like to do it. Well, that hasn't been done only in the movies. You know? But we have budgets, and if you don't make your budget, you don't build the building. And if you don't build the building, you're not an architect. You're just making drawings. Anyway, we built this thing. And it sits 
on a hill in Ken Lexington, Kentucky, in the middle of a thousand acre horse farm, and it has 88 columns in it. Uh, each column is nine feet high and 30 inches in diameter, made of curved brick and painted, which is in the vernacular there. And then there are sunscreens that go all the way around it, which are 20 inches apart and 20 inches deep. And it is a truly uh, system house, and it begins to own you after a while because it's very, very kind of the tyranny of the building. Because as you see, the top of the column is the underside of the sunscreen, which is the level of the ceiling, which is the top of the interior door, which is the top of the closet, which is the outside of the glass. And you've got to hit that line. And the minute you violate it, everybody screams and laughs and points things, and says mean, hateful things about you. And it talks to you forever, and it drove the good men that built it. This is standing at the front door, looking out towards as you come back up. And when you come in, you know, I am Pei one time said, he said, anybody can draw these things. He says, but you can really tell who's serious about how they put together. And here you can see this tyranny. But that's where our air comes in. See that slot in the floor, no grill. And that's where it goes away, is that slot up there, up above. You see another slot here. The front door is just to the left. Now, the point in this thing is that the concept was that nothing touches the column. The column stands free. When I have to have audio privacy, the, the petition will stop 10 inches away from the column, and a piece of glass goes into the column, into the floor, and into the petition with no volumes or stops. If I have to have audio and visual privacy, because like right behind that statue is my lady's bathroom, and it's really kind of silly to look in and see her in the tub. She wouldn't like it a bit. But as Sir John Soane taught us, that a mirror is a mirror when you see yourself. And when you don't see yourself, it's an illusionary device. And therefore, we have mirrors there on both sides, and the column goes right through on the ceiling and on the wall. And only if you're dumb enough to walk down the wall like that and scrape your head along the wall where you see yourself. So it really does work. And, uh, uh, skylights, as they turn and go through the house, like to the right, with exactly the same detail. And you can't see the drip pan and all that flashing junk. It's exactly it's the same way on the inside it does on the out. And this is looking right up the alley, uh, which is the main entrance when you come in the house. And just over the living room area, area, do we pop it to 11 feet? It's just this thin, clear story to announce this sort of sense of place. That's the breakfast room and the dining room to the left. And uh, you can see how uh, the glazing is working there. In some cases, it's a mirror. In this case, it is not in the master bedroom. But again, it's how these columns frame each time a different view in here. It's. <laughs> I took a bath in there. It's a little like bathing with the rock heads. Every time, you know, you reach up to wash, 2,000 arms. <laughs> this is a, uh, that little rod there is a quick release on the Venetian blinds since you're really facing right out if the lawn mowing crew is there. You better drop fast. I wish architects lived like this. <laughs> we have redesigned those lights. They look like they were created by the FAA here. We put little eyebrows on them and shut them up. But you know, they're really architects. We're all suckers for columns. And I think you've got 88. I'm going to take a minute and tell a very funny joke. I think it's funny. Anyway, I was at a design charrette at Mississippi State last year. And you know, you never get a crit in this business that you and I are in. And I was down there with Bob Stern, Peter Eisenman, Stanley Tigerman, Paul Kennan, and Charles Moore. And so I locked those cats up, and I showed them this building and another one. And the lights came on afterward, and Bob Stern said, did you notice that house with the columns? He said, those columns had neither capital, emphasis, or base. And I suggest they're not columns at all, but posts. <laughs> Peter Eisenman, 
heavy that he has said that that's postmodern. <laughs> Tigerman rides in fast and furious and says, no, that's new postmodern. Isn't that heavy? <laughs> All right, this is my last thing I'm going to talk about. But um, I, about two years ago, I got a call from a client who lived in central Pennsylvania where there's a very large gathering of Amish people. And uh, they showed me these beautiful 18th and early 19th and some late 19th century farms, uh, you know, where they still drive horse and buggies. And, uh, and it's really, truly beautiful. It's a real trip. And their 18th century buildings were particularly beautiful and skilled and put together with love and care and proportion. And they then showed me their building site, which was at the end of a mile long drive that was just at its own entranceway. And along this entranceway, beginning about 1900, executives of Armstrong Cork and other local heavies in the area had built houses of all of the great romantic and eclectic styles. And as you marched up this thing, you came around this one corner of the cul-de-sac, and you had Coca-Cola Colonial, Bankers, Tudor, Wall Street, Pastoral, and they were really very marvelous, and they looked across an absolutely dead level park of green, which they had all joined in an association with a whole mile to pay to get a, one lawn crew to mow this entire acreage as one glorious park. Well, they were happy as hogs in sunshine until all of a sudden they heard that that piece of ground that they thought was a park in common land had not only been sold, but they had hired a modern architect. And chills, it's really, you can imagine it. What in the world? I mean, how many really good modern buildings do you ever see anywhere? And I found out a long time ago that just because somebody lives in a Coca-Cola colonial house, he isn't necessarily Adolf Hitler married to Ilse Koch, you know? That really nice people live in those things. And even sometimes nice people build them. But I had a real thing on. You know, I was taught that in school. And uh, so I began worried very much about this thing because if I did my usual number sitting out there, my client would be hated, loathed. You know, you'd have to look out for apples with razor blades and things like that. And also, those were really very nice houses. So I hit on this design. I remember I do all of my design in airplanes because I, it's the only time there isn't a telephone. And all of this stuff really does begin on the back of a barf bag somewhere. And I had just arrived in my office with this really nutty house. And my client called. He said, you know, I think you really think my husband and I are very square, but we really want a modern house. And I said, have I got a thing for you? Anyway, 18th century Amish architecture had very traditional grape run brick narrow German siding. They always painted their doors this funny green turquoise color. The windows I could never understand in a double hung or the lower sash. Why well, they weren't reversed, but that's the way they did it. Five quarter inch mullions. And it was really kind of very beautiful, elegant, simple. And really it had a certain innate nobility about them. As you know, that when they married, they would, and their family expanded, they just added another house, and they bumped into each other. And to save the cost of flashing and all of that, which was very dear and rather unknown, really, they would sometimes bump into two and three. Well, we just sort of went on with that. <laughs> and we ended up with seven. And the neighbors around, you know, I mean, we are now I have now paid my respect to the neighbor. And I love the idea, because these things were called telescope houses, you know, like you could push one in. So as we went around, this is all reflective glass. And indeed, they really does telescope into each other. And it takes on a rather elegant <laughs> and whimsical look. Again, you know, the architecture is memorable only if it is irrational and expressive of our human condition. There's something I found rather beautiful about this, and yet basically insane. I was trying to say that, neighbors, we love you. Don't hate us. We respect the history and the technology of what 
produce this architecture. We have been extremely faithful to it, but we are basically people of this century and of this time, and that I have really a glass house in there that I have pasted this decal that is about two and a quarter inches over the glass and so that we can get to it. Now, you really begin to wonder, tell me more about your mason, you know, and your carpenter, did he drink? <laughs> but, you know, now clients, bless them, uh, usually can do things like this because they're not dumb. And I've never met a client yet where you can walk through the kitchen to get to the bathroom to get to the bedroom. And plans must work, but as you enter this thing, there's a closet, there's a powder room, there's a bar, of course, there's a stairway. You drop down two steps, and here's the living room with the all glass on one side, library, dining room, kitchen, and the next pavilion, laundry and mudroom, and then Papa's workshop with the garage tacked on beyond. And as you go up the stair, there are three bedrooms up above, and you go down below, there is the American, all-American rec room, spelled with a W. Anyway, as you come in that front door, you begin to realize that you've lost history, and there's a schizoid change, because you can go all the way up, and you realize that that slit of mirror on the side is indeed a window, and that each pavilion is indeed a telescope, and you can look out in each way. And you see the glass go all the way up and come back down that slip on the other side. And you can see the ridge and as each the second and third floor step back with glass railing. As you step down into the living room where this picture is taken, what was the basement window? There's a window right there, right on grade level. That is for the dog to bark at people coming to visit. There you can see the dog's window. That's the basement window you saw on the outside. Windows are above windows. And yet the house no longer has any mystery and it opens up into a living room that is at once filled with light and promises views of the garden beyond and uh, this one wall, which is all of exposed studs. Any of us who have built or have seen buildings under construction, there's nothing more beautiful than the American wood frame. And we always cover the bloody thing up. When I finally got one, as you'll see later on, where I could express that frame in something that's quite nice. The ceiling height here is 10 feet, and at the end, we glaze the whole bloody thing. Nope, I lost control. Now, when you go upstairs, each one of these things are 20 inches apart, and we have shutters in there to control the light, and it really gets kind of silly when she says, it's time to turn off the light, dear, and he gets up, and 28 times, he's got to go bang, bang, bang. <laughs> We tried, we tried to think, remember in all those prison movies in the 30s and 40s, and all, everybody's in the cell, and he said, all right, good night. <laughs> we could have done that, but we'd have to lose two pavilions, I think, to pay for it. Anyway, they closed the shutters. And this thing is continually changing during the light of the day. This reminds me very much of a Magritte. I wish I could say I had that in mind when I designed it, but I didn't. And you can just get a slight hint of the framing that's going on. Now, as you know, when you are in an all-glass house, if you don't light outside at night, it's like being in a black, wet tomb. The walls are navy blue, they're sweating, and your furniture is floating bizarrely out there, and you look rather bad as you walk through it. The minute you put a light on a tree or anywhere, you begin to erase that reflection, that goes away and your house expands. This wall lacks like a scrim. We can't see inside now because it's brighter outside than it is inside. However, at night, as you will see, bango, you turn on the lights and you can see, my God, why are they having those people for dinner? <laughs> we have turned out, well, we planted 36 white dogwood trees, which are out here, so you can see that. But when you turn on the dogwood trees, that orchard marches right inside from the outside, and you can't even tell what they're having to dinner, let alone who. And on the inside, it erases that reflection, and all you see are the trees. But when everything is out, the house turns back to playing with the sky and the light. And you've been a marvelous audience, and thank you very much.
Thank you. It's, I've gone on, blah, blah, and quiet good taste for an hour and 45 minutes. I never really do that. <laughs> yeah. See you later, guys. That is black asphalt shingle. A budget problem. We say 42000 That's right. That's right. And it's $42,000 cheaper, and it's got a 20-year warranty. <laughs> asphalt shingle. That's it. John's Manville, mm -hmm. Weatherbird or something. No, it's good stuff. As long as it glues down. You know, if it doesn't have that glued edge, it looks a little like Mamie Eisenhower again, who has her bangs fly up. <laughs> I've said an awful lot of pompous, outrageous things here tonight, and I'd love to get hit, or at least try to protect my right and left flank. I've seen an awful lot of faces there as I was going through my evangelical born-again opening. Yes? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Oh, let me, listen. I, and it's really a dirty crack, but I ran a graduate school for 10 years. I'd take kids right out of school. We would talk, you know, the frozen music trade eight hours a day. My buildings leaked, you know, the details were terrible. And about 10 years ago, I started hiring men with a minimum of five years' experience, preferably registered. My practice has doubled. Uh, for example, Gettysburg Library was done by one man. I do all the design in my office, and I overlook what they're doing, but one cat put that thing together with the structural and mechanical. He supervised the writing and the specs and supervised the job. I do, as I said, all the design. Uh, about 60%, I have a client here tonight who's going with it. 60% of the supervision, 90% of client relationships. And as far as the detailing, I've got very good men, but it basically is mine. You know, it isn't, you know, every job, as you can see, we have a very varied practice. But 